this year is really great because it is. And that shouldn't give away the whole secret to the national winter. Welcome to the Windsurfing Podcast, back again for episode 34. And this week, we've got a first for the podcast because we are bringing someone back. Yes, you requested it and we have done it. And we have got the man himself, Martin Bradner, is back for 2.0. And he's going to talk about uh, how he got into windsurfing, how he got working for F2, uh, what it was like working for F2 and being the boss. We're going to talk about the photo shoots and all the shenanigans there. Uh, we're going to talk also how he left F2. Uh, we're also going to talk about women in windsurfing uh, and we're going to touch on uh, what he plans to do next. There you go. You wanted it. We're delivering it. And we've also got to say a massive thank you to Mark Carolan, who has been sorting our sound out. If you noticed a difference last week, let us know in the comments below. Give him, a, give him a shout out. So without further ado, let's get on with the podcast. Martin, thanks for coming on again. Last time we... We discussed a lot of things, but then we were just texting and and uh, we realized that we could talk another how many ever hours. So here you are again. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, you know, in, in 28 years, you experience a lot of things and uh, you have a lot of things to, or stories to tell. Yeah. And I, I really love that picture in the back. The little yeah, threesome it's actually and jaws. One of my one of my favorite windsurfing shots. You know, it uh, you know, I told you last time I've been on Maui uh, 30 times or, or even 31 times. Uh, but I only saw Jaws happening one time, you know. And uh, this was super lucky because we, we had a we had a uh, um, I think a German dealer meeting there. And it was uh, before the photo shoot, so it was must have been March, April, and it was still at F2 times. And uh, we, you know, we had a full program with, with all, the, all the dealers, and I think we actually went to the North Shore workshop to show the dealers how they do all the, the fin uh, prototypes there. And then Jason comes running in, you know, all, you know, typically Jason, oh, 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 oh. what's up, Jason? Jaws is happening. Jaws is happening. I need to collect my stuff, you know. And, 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 and we calmed him down and said, you sure? Serious? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's already breaking. He has to go now, you know, and collect all his stuff. And so we quickly changed our plans and decided to go with all the dealers to go to the beach in Jaws and, and, and watch it. And, uh, I have to tell you, it was. I think you sailed that way, right? Yeah, uh, it's incredible. Heads off, you know. I was only on on the beach, uh, on, on on the rock. You know, you are. I don't know. You're 500 meters away and probably 100 meters above. And when the waves are breaking, the ground is shaking. You know, it uh, yeah, was one of the most. Uh, hmm? The sound, the energy, the yeah. The, when you see it on video and on pictures, it's not the same. Yeah, yeah. I, I get goosebumps when I think about it now. It's it, it's just it absolutely blew me away, you know. And, and the interesting thing was that must have been in uh, we started JP ninety seven, so it must have been probably ninety eight, ninety nine, you know. And uh, believe it or not, uh, on the picture you have Björn. Jason and Josh, they were really on one wave. And for Björn and for Josh, it was their first time in Jaws. They never sailed Jaws before. Jason has been there many times. So it was also for them, you know, they were all excited and it was something really special. And, and, and this shot uh, um, was done by Jono, Jono Knight. Uh, he was back then a quite famous photographer. He was kind enough to, to, to give me the, the slide because it was long before digital pictures. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it was an unforgettable moment, you know, when those guys were sailing there and, and it 
Uh, and, and this shot to have three guys, I have never seen a similar shot with three guys on one wave. It's so bloody dangerous, you know. Scary, <laughs> scary. Yeah. Yeah. Only yeah. Jason can think of something like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, I mean, I Jordan and Josh to, to, to go there sailing first time. I know how it feels. I mean, of course, I'm not even close to the wave sailing level of these guys, whatever. Yeah. But still, you know, it's, uh, yeah, you got to have balls to, to pull something like this off. So, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, you know, they, they didn't really plan that. You know, it just happened that they were all three of them on one wave and they saw that it could work. So nobody uh, got back or backed out and and, and uh, it was just unbelievable. And the interesting thing, I talked to Josh afterwards and he told me that he was also, uh, you know, he would never admit that he was really afraid, but he was under a lot of tension. And he said, actually sailing, because it was a really nice Jaws day where it wasn't bumpy. He said it was easy. You know, I mean, if you crash, you're in trouble. But he said the sailing or the riding was actually a lot easier than he thought. You know, and, and, and they were all, it was so funny because afterwards they were all so full of adrenaline. And, 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 and so it, that's a, uh, something I will, I will never ever forget. And that's yeah. why I love that picture so much. Yeah, it looks, it looks like a great Jaws day. We're going to yeah. get to, we're going to get to photo shoots and to how it was back in the day with the slides, as you say, and analog yeah. and, and whatever, but let's run it all the way back. Yeah. How did you, because we know you as the manager and whatever, but you're also a passionate windsurfer and you never got into competition. As you yeah. mentioned that it was quite, you were quite proud of it, that, that you were not, you know, a competitor before you were a manager. And most of the guys that are, that became brand managers or whatever were. So how did you even get into the sport? How was, I mean, you're from Austria, landlocked. No, uh, no sea, but a uh, pretty passionate country for windsurfing, actually. Yes, that, that's actually uh, quite a interesting story, you know. Uh, in Austria, it's kind of tradition, especially when I was a student, that uh, students uh, go for one sporting week per year with their class. Yeah? And normally, it's a skiing week. Uh, so for generations, that's basically organized by the government. So you have one week off in school and you go skiing together, you know, with your teachers. And it's actually something great. And uh, that uh, was in the 80s. And in 1981, uh, windsurfing started to become hip, you know, in, in Austria and in Europe. And um, some of our teachers got into windsurfing. And we were two classes, and then uh, our sports teachers uh, came up with the idea that instead of doing a skiing week, we could uh, we could go windsurfing to Lake Noisy, where the uh, Freestyle World Cup happened many times afterwards. But they said only one of the two classes could go, you know. So uh, and then they said, how can we decide? And then they had the idea that the two speakers of the, of the, of the two classes, I was the speaker of my class, you know, we were 25 Obviously. students. <laughs> uh, and uh, we had to go to the dean and we threw a coin and I won. And that's how I got into windsurfing. You know, otherwise I probably would have never started windsurfing because I am a very passionate snow skier. And I used to play indoor handball, you know, really, uh, I was uh, full on into handball. You know, I played in the youth league and with the adults. So I basically played handball f five times a week or practice and played. I also played in the, in the, in the school team. And I probably would have never gotten into, into uh, windsurfing because I wasn't much of a water person. I hated swimming, actually. Uh, but, but then... We, we went to Lake Neusiedl and uh, it was hilarious, you know, when I think back now, because our teachers, they were sporty guys, but they had as much idea about windsurfing as we had, zero. Huh? So we, and that shows how hip windsurfing was back then. We rented windsurf equipment from a normal sporting goods store because every sporting goods store in Austria, or pretty much every store carried windsurf equipment. Yeah. So we rented, I think, 10 sets, one board, one sail, 
or one rig. And we went to Lake Noise. And uh, two of the teachers had a little bit of experience, but none of them could jive really. You know, we knew that the wind had to come from the bank and you had to uphaul and you had to grab the, the sail and you had to have the mast in the front, but that was about it. Yeah. But, you know, I think from the first few minutes when I started going and it was really, you know, slow and as you can imagine on the lake, I was totally fascinated from, from the very first uh, moments. And um, it was uh, uh, interesting because after a while we found out how to steer a little bit, yeah, but, uh, but we had people getting lost all over the lake and, and, and so it was... Uh, it uh, was hilarious, but but through that uh, I really got excited about it. And after that week, I decided I will become a windsurfer, and uh, um, I bought a Mister competition. I don't know if you remember that board. You know, it, no. it, it was actually okay. You, it was you're either, it was to, either the windsurfer back then or the Mister, yeah. right? Was just yeah. The, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. But the, 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 the interesting thing back then was that I basically started on a Mistral competition. So it was a, a race board, yeah. And, and, and I started on that board. It was long and, and quite narrow. And uh, somewhere back there, you could mount footstraps. But I thought, you know, I'm standing in the middle here. So how, how this must be a joke, you know, how can you ever stand back there? Uh, but then I realized that the uh, Mr. Competition was super heavy, you know, and it had this black rubber edge. You might you might have seen the board. It looked similar to a windsurfer. But then I decided uh, I need to get serious, and I bought a used Comet Slalom, which was kind of the one step up for me from a big board, you know. And, and so I, I bought that, and I got really enthusiastic. You know, we, we went to, to, to Lake Garda many times, and... But I never took any windsurfing lessons. Yeah? So I, I, I got a little bit better. I was able to get planning. But my huge problem was I couldn't try. You know? uh, and I, I could uh, go downwind. And when I wanted to shift the sail, my board would go back into the wind again. And I just couldn't figure it out what I did wrong. You know, sometimes I pulled the jive off, but I didn't know why. You know? So it, it, it was... Uh, I was getting a little uh, almost depressed or, or frustrated and, and but then one season I decided okay next year I'm going to take windsurfing lessons you know I want to get that damn uh, jibe uh, dialed in because I I was watching people from the beach and really trying to copy what they did but I just couldn't figure it out by myself you know? okay so 35 years passed from that moment and you are describing an experience of so many windsurfers. It's incredible. It's incredible that it's still, till this day, you know, the fun starts, they get planing and then they get stuck on the jibe, you know? Uh, oh yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit about that later because uh, this also keeps coming back to my mind and I think this is where windsurfing needs to do something. Yeah, uh, But uh, I was still super enthusiastic, you know, and, and back then I was not living where I live now. So it was a nine hour drive to Lake Gala. Yeah? And, and to give you an example, because there, there wasn't, a, most of the way it wasn't autobahn back then. It was just normal, normal roads. And uh, so we usually uh, drove uh, during the nights to be able to spend the weekend at, at Lake Gala. Yeah? So I would, I would go there, drive all night, arrive at 10 a.m., totally, you know, didn't sleep basically. And we went windsurfing. Back then I didn't really even understand that there was a morning wind, a north wind, and in the afternoon a, a south wind. It was windy and we, 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 we went windsurfing. And I was uh, still up hauling. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't water start, but hardly anybody was water starting. You know, only the, the really good guys were water starting back then. And so I was up hauling and jiving pretty much on, on uh, falling on pretty much every jive. And after four or five hours, I uh, was, you know, I fell, got on my board again, ready to uphold, and I got really dizzy, you know, uh, and I almost blackened out. 
because I didn't sleep at all. I was probably pretty dehydrated. And I said, okay, well, now it's probably time to, to take a break. But that's how, how crazy I was about, you know, I, I yeah. loved it so much. And, um, yeah. Yeah. But listen, from having passion and from being crazy about the sport to be, to becoming a brand manager of, of the biggest brand, uh, it's, it's quite a, quite a road. So how, how did you even get into, get into the industry? Was it like you, you actively seeked a job in the industry or it just fell there? Or, you know, maybe, maybe there are people that think like, oh, I would love to correct the passion with the, with, with my job and how the hell yeah. do you do that? You know? Yeah, it, 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 it happens step by step, you know, uh, you know, as I said, by trade, I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer and, uh, uh, I've been at that time when I started windsurfing, uh, I've been working, uh, for a, uh, industrial company that produced uh, agricultural machines. Uh, and, uh, I was basically responsible for marketing and sales, uh, or, because I pretty soon realized that even though I'm an engineer, I didn't want to sit in front of a drawing board. Back then, there were no computers. You had to do it all by hand and calculate stuff. Uh, I, I realized that I was more tending into, in, towards marketing and stuff. So I was organizing trade shows and, and brochures and photo shoots, but with, with farmers, you know, with agricultural machines. And, um, after four years doing that, uh, I started to, um, get a little bit bored of it and wanted to do something else. And I was, I was super lucky because I had a super cool boss. Yeah? He was, uh, he didn't fit into that company at all. He was from British petrol, you know, from the petrol company before, you know, and, uh, uh he, he, he would always wear cowboy boots and, and, and the tuxedo and stuff. So he, he didn't fit into the farmer's world at all. And so he also realized this is not the right area for him. And he decided to leave. And before he left, he had a meeting with me and, uh, uh, he said, Mr. Brandner, you know, we had a formal relationship and he said, I think you are quite talented in the sales and marketing area, but you have one issue. And that issue is that your English is lousy. You know? And back then my English was catastrophic, you know, from becoming a, a mechanical engineer, you didn't have much English. Uh, and uh, back then, 35 years ago, you didn't need it that much. Yeah. And that really gave me a wake up call. And, uh, funny enough, I met some people who knew some people in the U S and, uh, pretty soon after that, I quit my job and uh, went to the U S for a year yeah, to, to basically improve my English. And. At that time, I already owned the Sunset Slalom and I took the board with me. It was actually, uh, quite looking back now, quite funny because it was, I was, uh, 23, 24. For the first time in my life, I would fly. You know, I took a train to Zurich with my windsurf equipment. I, I don't remember how I did it, but somehow I managed it. And then I flew from Zurich to Portland, Oregon. And, uh, because I, I have read, uh, stories or heard stories about the gorge, you know, how, how great it is to, to windsurf. Yeah. So I took my equipment with me and, uh, yeah, I, I stayed there for a year, went to university and uh, I actually originally went there to, to work for an Austrian guy who had a, uh, a little company there. He was importing Austrian uh, jewelry and, and traditional stuff from Austria. And I was kind of his handyman to repair the, whatever there was to repair in the warehouse and stuff. And, uh, but unfortunately his business didn't work too well because at that time the U S dollar went down compared to, it wasn't Euro yet, but the Austrian shillings or all the European currencies. So his business didn't work importing Austrian stuff because it become really expensive for Americans. Um, so he, I couldn't work for him anymore. But on the side, I already started my studies. Yeah? But then it was actually, again, a lucky coincidence. Uh, there was a Mexican restaurant right next to his company. And we often had lunch or dinner there. And then I told the guys, hey, I'm, I'm out of a job. I'm studying now. 
I need a job. And they said, we need a dishwasher. So I started working for them as a dishwasher in a Mexican restaurant. You know, I had a student visa, but I didn't have a work visa. So they kind of had to hide me. I was working in the in the basement, washing washing dishes, but I was still able to windsurf. You know, every weekend I would drive to the gorge. I bought a car for 500 US. Every second time driving to the gorge, the car would break down. It didn't work anymore. It was 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 uh, hilarious. But then I saw the gorge, you know, and back then you cannot imagine what was happening in Good River. I don't know if you have been there. Huh? No, not yet. No. <laughs> but, but but it was back then. It was it looked like the windsurfing capital of the world, you know, com comparable to uh, Torbole in in Italy at Lake Garda. There were five or six windsurfing shops in this tiny little town, and it was just super cool. And there were so many windsurfing spots along the river. Uh, and uh, uh, I thought, why don't I write a story about this spot? Because it, it was, you know, in actually at Lake Garda, uh, when I was uh, there for windsurfing, there was a windsurfing shop, Oradini, you, you might Still know. Still there. Still there. Yeah, I know. But, but back then, it was the whole building. You know the building now, right? Yeah, back yeah, yeah. there, this whole building was a windsurfing shop, you know, uh, basement and, 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 and uh, uh, or ground level and first floor. And they had a huge chill area where they showed videos, you know, back then VH, VHS windsurfing videos were the big thing. So whenever it was rainy or shitty weather, we would sit there and watch videos. And they are, uh, often they played videos from the gorge. And, uh, but I haven't seen a story about the gorge in any of the magazines. So I thought, why don't I contact one of the magazines? And in Germany back then, if I remember correctly, I think we had three magazines. We had Surf, which still exists, Surfen, and I think we even had a third one. And I contacted Surfen and asked them if they might be interested to get a story. And they were super interested and offered me, a, I don't remember how much it was, but a very reasonable amount of money for it. So I got to work and took tons of pictures, talked to people, made drawings, and wrote a, a, a big story about the spot, about the gorge for them. Yeah? Uh, six or eight pages. And, 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 uh, was, uh, and then I thought, Wow, this was actually pretty easy, and and I should I should get into that business somehow. You know? And uh, after one year, I came back from the US, and then I applied for a job with us too, but I didn't hear anything. Uh, as yeah. a, as a, what what was the position you were applying? Uh, Whatever for a job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I I would have done anything, you know, just just to get a job with them. Um, but I didn't hear anything from them. Uh, so I actually decided to spend a summer, one this summer when I came back, I think I came back in, in May or something from the US as a windsurf instructor, you know? And, and I remembered uh, the, the windsurfing lessons that I took at Lake Garda. It was actually a very special setup, which uh, I still think was superb compared to everything that I've seen afterwards. It was a windsurfing camp at a campground in Torbole. And they had about 100 students every week. Most of them were really not windsurfing students, but students from Austria. They brought the guys down with a bus. Everybody was living in tents. There was in the middle uh, a huge table for 100 people. And around them were all the tents, and we had breakfast together uh, every day. And uh, two or three times a week, we had uh, a spaghetti party. You know, there was a restaurant in the campground, and they would cook spaghetti for us. And it was an unbelievable time. And so I applied for a job as a windsurf instructor there, and they hired me immediately. Yeah, By then, I could drive already, like, finally, after four or five years. And... Uh, uh, after a few weeks, I became actually, I managed the camp. Yeah, there were, we, I think we had about 100 students and 12 to 15 instruct, <coughs> instructors. And, and, and I was kind of managing it. And at the same time, I was teaching a beginner lessons. Yeah? And, 
I, this was maybe this, uh, one of the best times of my life. You know, it, it, it was pure windsurfing, living in tents, windsurfing every day. And you guys can't, cannot imagine what, what happened at Lake Garda back then, you know, and how cool it was to be a windsurfer, you know, and the beach in Torbele, you, uh, I tell you, you could hardly walk into the water. There was so much windsurf equipment on the beach. It was unbelievable. And then there were, you know, sometimes there was quite a short break for a lake, but good people would sail out uh, from Torbole, from the beach. And beginners were in between, you know, falling and catapulting. And it, it was a circus. It was, but everybody loved it, you know, and, and, and the whole feeling, I will never forget all the, the evenings in Torbole, you know, there were certain bars where all the windsurfers would go and, 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 you know, the, 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 the waiters had to push people aside when cars would want to drive through because there, there were so many, so many windsurfers and people. And there were always some celebrities, you know, I remember, uh, one time, for instance, that Mikey Eskimo, you know, everybody at the lake. Eskimo is in town, is at the lake somewhere. And then in the evening, we really saw him, you know, with his long hair. And he was actually a boy from Vienna, you know, but he was back then, he was the, the king of the covers of the, uh, of the magazine covers. So it was uh, uh, a fantastic time. Yeah, sounds like uh, I'm about to cry <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you tell these stories, you know. But uh, I, 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 it was. Uh, um, as I said, it was so cool to be a windsurfer, you know, kind of the, the status that you had in the society. That's why everybody wanted to be a, a windsurfer. You know, all those students, most of them were from Graz, from a, a city in Austria. And uh, there was a whole, when they went back to Graz, there was a whole society. They would meet every weekend, just the windsurfers would get together and talk about windsurfing and then occasionally go to Lake Neusiedl because that, that was very closer than, than, than uh, uh, Lake Garda. And, and we, even had, uh, we even had Christmas parties, you know, all the windsurfers had Christmas parties in, in Austria. You know? So it's something that yeah. you cannot imagine anymore today, but it yeah. was just... Uh, and, and the more I got the taste of this, the more I thought, how, how great would it be to work in this area? But as I said, I applied for a job with F2, didn't hear anything. So after this summer, there I worked at Lake Garda. And when the season was over at Lake Garda, I worked in Turkey for a month as, as a windsurf instructor. And then I found a job in Vienna uh, with a direct mailing company, as they called it back then, they, they, they had a catalog and were selling special underwear. Um, and I did all the marketing for them. Again, uh, photo shoots and stuff uh, and, and brochures and, and, and direct mailings. You know, they had a huge file of addresses and uh, it was way before internet, obviously, but it was quite interesting. And then after one year, I get a letter, a letter from F2. No, no email because there was no email at of that course. time. And I will, uh, you know, you cannot imagine how nervous I was when I got this letter from F2, you know, and I opened it up and they invited me for a job interview. You know? uh, so I went for this job interview and I got the job. Uh, what I didn't ask as kind of the marketing and product development assistant of the CEO. Uh, and uh, what I didn't know was that F2, just a few months before that, went bankrupt. So they were not in good shape. And uh, they basically uh, laid off pretty much everybody except for the development people, but they had, the, they had their own factory. And it looks like my profile, you know, with having a technical background, uh, having done things in marketing and being an enthusiastic windsurfer was good enough for them to, to, to give me that job. And uh, so I became the assistant of the CEO, but the CEO was um, also the CEO of the mother company of F2, uh, which was an industrial uh, company. And uh, he had absolutely no idea about uh, windsurfing. Uh, that, was, that was actually one, one funny story that 
uh, he wants to, to, to get to understand windsurfing a little bit. Um, he went to Tenerife to take a windsurfing lesson incognito. You know, he didn't tell anybody who he was. And he booked a, a windsurfing lesson in the evening. And in the next, next morning, he showed up at Klaus Garmick Center to start his windsurfing lesson. And he had his wetsuit on already. But the wrong way around, he had the zipper in the front. <laughs> That's how much he Classic, understood yeah. about windsurfing. <laughs> yeah. Classic. But why, what, what year was that? And, and I mean, from all you telling me, windsurfing was booming. So how the hell did they manage to go bankrupt at that time? Okay, yeah, so I started with F2 the fall uh, of uh, 1989. And F2, yeah, that, that, that's the funny thing, you know. Uh, windsurfing was booming, but the windsurfing brands were spending money like crazy because they thought, you know, the founder of F2, Peter Brockhaus, uh, who also founded the German Surf Magazine. He was a very visionary guy. And he always kept telling that windsurfing is going to be as big as skiing in Europe. Huh? And he he thought it would go there. And that's why he thought he had to invest money to 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 get there. And he they sponsored people like like crazy and 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 invested money in marketing and development. And at the same time, all the brands had huge quality problems, you know, huge warranty problems. Uh, you might remember the company um, Klepper, uh, another German, yeah. was actually really big. They died because they had so many warranties. And uh, uh, so, yeah, if, if because of that, and, and, and team riders, you know, you guys cannot imagine that anymore, but windsurfing was so much in the eye of the public that there was a German windsurfing team, for instance. Yeah, We can go through names later. And they uh, went, basically got together, and they had sponsors together as the German windsurfing team. And they had Audi, and they all got a car. You know, they, they, some of them were only racing in Germany. Still, they got a car, you know, to, to use from Audi. Uh, you know, Audi Actually, this still, this still happens. This still happens. And Germany is still going so strong. I'm so surprised sometimes. It's, it's amazing. It's great yeah, to see. But I tell you, it, it cannot be compared to back then. Of course, because of course, it, of course. Those guys had real salaries, you know, uh, full on. And um, so... But I think to, to, to make it simple, the, the companies just spend way too much money. You know? and, and for instance, they also, some of the windsurfing centers, rental places, got their equipment for free because they thought we have to promote the sport uh, so that it really, everybody tries it in the hotels and everywhere, and then it will grow and grow. And, and, and there was a time, you know, when there were, uh, that was actually before my time, uh, where there were more than 100,000 boards sold just in Germany, you know, and, and, and people were basically waiting in line for the boards to arrive to get them, you know, so it, 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 it you cannot compare it to, to what yeah. we have today. So what do you think the peak was of, of, of selling like mid eighties, early eighties, mid eighties, because you know, the golden era of the PWA and all that stuff is like late eighties, early nineties or whatever. But I think the actual sport was the biggest earlier, right? Like you imagine yeah, when everybody yeah, wanted yeah. to try it. I kind of missed the peak already. You know, when, 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 when I came in, in 89, um, there were a lot of companies already in trouble because the, the numbers were already going down. I obviously wasn't aware of that, you know, and, and I would have, whatever they would have offered me, I would have taken that job yeah, because I was so, it, it was always, Basically, my dream to, as I said, I was always an enthusiastic skier and windsurfer. So uh, my dream was always to work either in the skiing industry or in the, in the windsurfing industry. And then I was lucky enough to, to, to get this job. Yeah. yeah. So you were assistant of the CEO, like a windsurfing assistant of a CEO that had no idea about windsurfing. So effectively, yeah. you're straight away the, almost the manager of the brand, aren't you? Because yeah. you are the right hand man of the of the boss. So what is what is your what is your first like first things to do on the to do list? 
you get there and what do you see? What, what are you thinking? What are you, you know, what is the vision? Yeah, I have to say we had, uh, we had uh, Werner Knigler was already there, you know, uh, Peter Thomann and Klaus Walter, you know, they were kind of the developed. Klaus Walter did the F2 sales. He was the designer for the F2 sales. And uh, Werner was actually more a tester. He started shaping at that time. And Peter Thomann was the, was the, the, the shaping guru. Huh? Uh, so I had this core team more or less. And, uh, we also had a, a marketing agency, which basically consisted of former F2 employees. Huh? Uh, they more or less, um, lost their jobs uh, along the way when F2 went bankrupt and started the agency. So we used this agency, uh, for marketing stuff. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I obviously met with that agency and, and, and we, we, we tried to work out a plan. And uh, I think I told you in the, in the first interview, this one of the first things I did was to visit Jörn. You know, I, I flew to Grand Canaria to get to know him and, and, and understand the competition of the side of the sport a little bit better because I haven't been at the World Cup at that time. You know, I have never seen a World Cup competition. Uh, and now I had to deal with, 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 uh, World Cup riders and I had to do their contracts and stuff. Uh, uh but then something quite interesting happened, uh, approximately after two years. Um, I think for the first time since I'm married, um, we decided to go for a non windsurfing or skiing vacation. Uh, uh, we went to, to the U.S. Uh, we met with some friends that I had from my year in, in, in Oregon. We rented a van and drove all over the U.S., uh, visited all the, the state parks and stuff. And uh, it was a three-week uh, vacation. Uh, and uh, I, I really kind of earned to have such a long vacation because I was working like crazy, you know, to get to understand the job and everything. Uh, I usually uh, arrived in the office at 7.30 and hardly ever left before 9. Yeah, so we were on vacation and uh, I, every few days I would call uh, F2 to see if everything uh, was okay, if everything was running. And I call, I, I will never forget that I call from a phone booth somewhere. I don't remember where it was. And uh, we already, I kind of knew that something was coming. But I, I, I call in the company and they tell me that the CEO has been fired. Uh, because he wanted to move part of the F2 factory or the machinery to Hungary. Move the factory out of Austria for certain reasons. But uh, he obviously started that already to move machinery and one of the people working for me had to do that or had to oversee it and they basically caught him doing it because he didn't have approval from the owners uh, so they fired him on the spot and then they called me and said Martin are you willing and ready to run the windsurfing division and I said yeah sure no problem you know, because I, <laughs> I, I thought this 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 uh, was my chance you know and uh, oh, obviously I was uh, totally excited and uh, uh, but I was at the phone booth yeah, and, and I said okay I, I can't really talk here and I, I think I didn't have enough coins so I said you know what because normally we always stayed at campgrounds I will book a hotel we, we get a hotel and I call you from the hotel so I called again and then we discussed some more details and I was all enthusiastic and, and, and without, I have to say, without too much thinking, you know, will I be actually able to, to do this? And, and then I think the next day, I don't remember how it came that we talked on the phone, but I talked to the chief tester of the surf magazine, you know, uh, Kutte Prisner. He's not with the magazine anymore. Uh, because he's probably close to 70. Uh, and I was 26 at that time, you know, so I was, I was really young and, and uh, we talked on the phone and for some reason he knew about it. And he said, Martin, are you, are you sure you can handle that? Do you, you ready for that? And I said, yes, uh, I will, you know, I will put all my energy in. I, I can, I can do it somehow. But when I hung up, I thought, he, he's, he's right, you know, um, do I know what, what I get myself into here? You know, will I be able to really handle all that? Uh, 
But, you know, I had a talk with my wife and when we came back from the vacation, we, we finished our vacation as planned because, you know, it wasn't that easy to change all the flights and everything. And then, yeah, I just uh, tried. I, I basically, you know, my mother always uh, said when I was still in school, you know, whenever you have a difficult situation, try your best. If you fail, you cannot, you know, be upset with yourself because you tried your best. So I thought I'll try my best. They went bankrupt before. So, um, you know, I, I hope I can do better than that. Uh, but at the same time, I was super, super lucky because uh, I had to, I had the chance to put my own team together. You know, so apart from the, uh, development people, as I said, and the sales administration and the factory people who were still all there. There was no marketing and product management team. You know? So I was able to uh, hire all those people myself. You know, And that's super lucky because normally when you uh, get into a management position, when a company hires you, you have to live at least with with, uh, with part of a team that's already there. Yeah? And then either you like them or not, but they have certain knowledge. So you have to work with what you got more or less. Yeah? And, yeah, and I, I was lucky enough. I hate to be a dick, but mm -hmm. it sounds like the the Martin Brandner of 45 years old would never hire the Martin Brandner of 24 in the first place, you know, with the, with the CV that you had at the time. And then again, you know, to be, it's almost unimaginable to, to, to give now the reins of the brand to a guy that's 26. You know what I mean? So it's, it's quite crazy. Actually, you must have been like, um, good at uh, pursuing people, uh, how you say, um, you know, turning people over and, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, uh, you know, for my position, difficult to say, but I think everybody saw that I was trying really hard, you know, and that I was quite systematic, you know, and didn't just one day believe in this and the other day believe in that. And um, again, the, the success was uh, only possible because I was lucky enough to hire those people. Most of them were actually former windsurf colleagues of mine. They were also students. And uh, Andy Bichler, our marketing guy, for instance, and, and, and Christoph Kirschner, who became the sales manager first. He was a product manager uh, for, for bags and accessories and fins. Uh, then he became sales manager. Now he owns a windsurfing center and another... Uh, 3D printing company. So I, I was really lucky to, to, to obviously hire good people. And I hired the sales manager, uh, Dieter Fellhofer, uh, who was also, they all, all three of them were former windsurf instructor colleagues of mine. Yeah? yeah. And only thanks to this, to this team. And they were all unexperienced. Yeah. But windsurfing back then, uh, was, was different than today. You know, the, the, I wasn't only the youngest uh, brand manager back then, but all the other guys, they were 45, 50, and maybe they didn't have the, 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 the energy and, 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 uh, that I had, you know, and, and all the ideas. And uh, also this, this um, agency that we used, you know, they had, uh, they had fantastic ideas. They do windsurfing. Uh, it's actually funny, you know, Reinhard Pascha, he used to be... Uh, the sale designer of F2 sales before. Yeah? And then he left and then he started this agency and him and, and all his colleagues and a, a certain Stefan Brucker, he was a designer. He did uh, uh, all the brochures and stuff for us and, and many other people. And they were a real, back then we could afford that. They were real marketing agencies with even various creative teams, you know, so they had three teams work on an ad campaign for us, for instance, you know, and they would present three different ad campaigns to us and then we got one to choose. So, um, and, uh, yeah, it probably also happened that I went to, to this university in Portland where I got to know this uh, Nike professor and, and yeah, it was, uh, it was just a, a great time and, and things just, went up like yeah. this and, and, and we, we were profitable from, from there on. Yeah. A lot of, um, 
a lot of good timing, a lot of uh, hard work, but also a lot of things just uh, kind of happening, right? I mean, so hey, many, absolutely. so many. I was, at the, I was at the right spot at the right time, you know, and, yeah. and, and was lucky to, to meet the right people, have the right people around me. Yeah. And when you, when you hire people, you know, I, that's why I more or less mostly hired people who I knew from the past because in an interview, and, and the, as you said, I might not, not have, might not have hired myself, you know, 20 years later. Um, I don't know, but, but it really helps if you know the background of a person. And sometimes real knowledge is maybe not that super important as long as the guy wants it bad enough, you know, and is willing to learn and really work hard for it. Yeah? And I tell you, we were working really hard. You know, I was the first one in the office and the last one to leave. And, uh, you know, I, I had, I remember one day when, you know, I was already in Kirchdorf where I still live, this little town in, in Upper Austria. And I was, uh, I had to get something from the pharmacy or something. I went to town and went to the pharmacy. And when I came out, I thought, it's actually quite a nice town here, but I haven't seen any anything of it because I moved there. You know, I wasn't originally from there. But uh, all I did was work, do sports or travel. But I haven't seen the town at all. You know, I, I never went out for dinner or something because there was no time for that. Yeah, and it sounds like uh, we mentioned this with with Craig a little bit that when you everybody wants to work in the windsurfing industry to windsurf. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah. a, that's a bit of a misconception, right? Like it sounds like you didn't actually have any time for for fun. Maybe on the weekends, I don't know, whatever. But yeah, uh, on, on the weekend or uh, for vacation, you know. That, that's why my my poor wife had to live with that because for me there was no question. Vacation is windsurfing, you know. Yeah. And uh, luckily she could stand that and, and and came with me all the time, but. Uh, um, yeah, I, I still enjoyed it uh, tremendously, you know, and, and, and uh, there is actually one pretty interesting story because when I had this job interview, you know, with the CEO who got later fired, but he told me, yeah, uh, Mr. Brandner, you know, uh, Lake Neusiedl is not too far away, so on the weekend you might be able to go windsurfing and we have a ski area half an hour from here because I didn't know the area there. Yeah? So, and, and, and he made it sound to me like I thought, fuck, I'm, I'm getting into paradise here. Uh, 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 and, but the reality was that I think the first, first four years I was never able to take an extra day off to go skiing or anything. You know, and actually the opposite. I remember one time I left the office Friday 4.30 or something like that to drive to Lake Gala to go windsurfing. On Monday, I come to the office. I have a letter on my table, a warning, an official warning that I left on Friday at 4, 4.30 without telling the CEO or asking for approval from the CEO. Uh, I was shocked. You know, I, thought, you know, I don't want to lose this job and I... I would never ever leave again Friday afternoon early, you know. So that that, that was the the reality. The culture, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned F two sales. I think a lot of, for sure, my generation doesn't remember that. The most, the furthest I can remember is arrows, pretty much. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, how did that? Like, I mean, F two was at some point in the 90s so big that it would make sense to have F2 sales, right? But that wasn't there anymore. What's the story? What's the story behind that and the conception of Arrows? Because you guys started Arrows from scratch, right? Or did you buy it? Yeah, yeah you started yeah, Arrows yeah. from scratch, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, um, you know, it's quite a long time ago, so I really need to dig in, 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 in my memory about that. But... Uh, it was a totally different world back then. You know, F2, we had our own board factory. And uh, originally it was in the buildings of, of, of this uh, technical company. But then they actually built an extra building just to build boards, you know, brand new, with huge F2 logos. So, and, and that factory was already in place when I arrived. So when I arrived there, you know, I hope, 
wow, uh, I, I was deeply impressed. And they even had a sail factory. They produced sails there. Uh, but it wasn't sustainable, you know, because uh, already many other brands started producing in China. And uh, F2 sales wasn't going that great. And uh, at that time, we thought together with the agency that you need to be a specialist back then. Every, actually in every sport, you know, in skiing, you had a ski from one brand, you had a binding from another brand, and you had a boot from another brand. That's totally different now, 35 years ago. But back then, it was like that. There were thin brands, like Concrete Wave. We also had Concrete Wave. I don't know if you ever heard that name, but in Germany, it was quite a famous thin brand. And... Uh, so we decided to kill F2 brand, uh, F2 uh, as, as, as a sale brand and start Arrows. Uh, we basically came up with that name together with the marketing, marketing agency. They created a logo and we started from scratch. But we had um, one very interesting setup. You know, uh, we obviously needed uh, a manufacturer and uh, I already knew Neil by back, uh, back then. I don't remember exactly how I got to know him, but um, I had a meeting Neil, with Neil him. Pride, and, of course, that is. Uh, Neil, Neil, Neil Pride, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, and um, I had a meeting with him and we discussed that we want to get into into the sale business and how we could do that. And then we came up with a very interesting concept because I didn't, uh, unfortunately, I had to let uh, Klaus Walter, the sale designer, go because we wanted to start and, and start all over and, 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 and have a new concept. And uh, so we worked out a concept where Neil was ready to give us the sail designs from the year before, you know, the, the shapes of the sails. And we could work with one of his designer, designers to further develop those sails. And, and that's what we finally agreed to do. So Willy uh, Blau, Neil right? basically... Yeah. Hmm? That was Willy Blau, right? Or not, uh, no, not yet. It, it, in the beginning, it was, uh, if I remember correctly, it was Nils Rosenblatt. Yeah? Ah, okay. Uh, back then, Barry Spania was kind of the Peter Thoman. He was the very famous sail designer and Nils Rosenblatt. He did the NR sail, the, the wave sail. Yeah. But he, the, Neil always believed in competition. So the two sail designers had a real competition. It was to a point that the two guys wouldn't even be in the sail loft at the same time. You know, the one guy would work in the morning, the other one in the afternoon. And uh, so we got uh, Nils Rosenblatt to further develop uh, the, the, the Neil Pride sales from the year before. And in return, we had to produce in Neil's factory. Uh, and that um, worked actually surprisingly well. You know, we put some, we hired team riders, Peter Fallbart, uh, uh um, and, 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 and some other people. We didn't have, we never had Bjorn on Eros. Um, yeah, you had, I, I made a little, I digged a little, uh, I mean, you had, that's probably later, but you had yeah. Francisco Goya on his, uh, on his world title years. You had Ant Baker. Uh, you had uh, Karen Yagi. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you had uh, Dave White, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Peter Folbert, that they were kind of our, our main characters back then. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we were quite successful with Eros. We, we even managed to have masts produced at Dornier. Uh, you know, we, we, everywhere we tried to, to, to do new things, you know, slightly different from other people. So Dornier, the aerospace company, you know, they produced masts for us, uh, pre break masts. And they were at that time the best masts on the market, but they were super expensive to produce. But there was even one time when Bjorn secretly used our masts. You know, he was on Ipad and wasn't allowed to use our masts, but secretly he, he, he used our masts back then. And there was quite a, uh, quite a discussion afterwards, uh, as, as you can imagine. But yeah, it, uh, it worked, uh, great and, uh, but uh, the, the Willem Blau came in later, and, and that was then already when I left. Yeah, but uh, Eros didn't survive long after me and my team left left F two. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, that's just. Well, I have one more point here. Let's say in that in that era, because 
photo shoots and marketing and all that stuff that considers pictures and videos back then must have been such a pain in the ass. I cannot even imagine. Like now, you know, we're shooting this and we can put it on YouTube tomorrow, you know, or even today, you know. But back then, <laughs> the photographer, he needs to go in his dark room. He needs to, you know, I don't even know the what the process, I don't even remember. And then you need the, <laughs> to send the slides and then you need to, you know, mail it by normal mail. If you want to get it into the magazine, you need to mail yeah. it all over the world, right? Yeah. So, and the, and the films, I mean, I remember like my first con PWA contest, John Carter still mounted a camera. It was already a digital camera, but he mounted a camera on my mast, like a proper freaking five kilo camera, you know, with a lens and yeah. everything, you know, it, it was yeah. so far removed. And this was like 2010, yeah. you know, so, <laughs> or yeah, but, but, but magic, you know, it's, it, it goes even further, you know, um, back then photo shoots, there was no email. We had a, I remember when I came to Maui, um, I bought a fax machine, you know, so that we could send faxes from our house. Yeah. But um, maybe before we go into that, I, I, I want to tell you a little story. My first photo shoot, you know, I missed my first photo shoot, you know, so I got hired by F2 in fall. And then there was the first photo shoot in April. And a week or so before that, I had a mountain bike accident and I broke my atlas. You know, I was unbelievably lucky. Uh, I just recently got the documents from the hospital because they would have thrown them away and it's 30 years ago now. And it's the same, I had the same accident as Christopher Reeve, the Superman actor. He fell off a horse and broke the atlas, but he was paralyzed from here down, you know, for the rest of his life. And uh, I fell with my mountain bike full on the head, no helmet, nothing. And uh, so uh, I, I was just, as I said, unbelievably lucky because I even rode on with my bike. I rode home and asked my landlord who rented this apartment to me to take me to the hospital. He took me to the hospital. They took x-rays and then there was chaos in the hospital because they realized that my neck was broken more or less. Yeah? And uh, then they put me in plaster. Uh, unbelievable story because, you know, I had to fly, lie flat for two days uh, to, to keep it still. They did an MR. They had to bring me to a different hospital because this hospital didn't have an MR. They, they, they did an MR and so, so that it was really broken, but it, it, it didn't move into the nerves, you know. So it looked okay, but they knew that they couldn't move me. Any movement could have basically paralyzed myself. So, and then just quickly, you know, after two days lying flat, they set me up again to put the place down. They sit me up again and I blacken out because I have been sitting, uh, lying for two days. And and I, I couldn't see anything. And I, I was sitting on, on a, on a um, stool, you know, so that, and, and, and people were holding me, you know, they were holding my head, my shoulders so that I don't fall over. And when I could see again, I saw the, 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 the head of the emergency room, the doctor in front of me, and he was sweating like crazy, you know, because he, he was afraid that I might get paralyzed. And then he opened a big book and he put plaster on me because he had never done it before for a broken atlas. Yeah? So with this thing, I was in plaster from here up to here, my neck, everything here, here. Yeah, you were not going was, to Maui. <laughs> I was not going to Maui. <laughs> and you cannot imagine how that was for me. You know, the, the dream of every windsurfer, I have a job with F2 and I can't uh, go to Maui. But then the year after, I was healthy and fit again. I went mean, actually through a really rough time with this plaster thing and, and stuff. Uh, but uh, I managed to, to become fit again and I went, uh, I went to Maui. And, and just one quick story because otherwise I lose it again. You know, I had no idea about Maui. And we had, we had Werner and, 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 and Klaus Walter. And we, I think we already had a house in Sprax. And we decided to, to, have, to take pictures 
uh, in Camp One, if I remember correctly. And we had a lot of equipment, and and we decided to sail it down. And I've never sailed in in in, in Maui before, you know. And the guys took the equipment and took off. And uh, I was supposed to also sail one set of equipment down. And, and I saw the guys flying down, and I just followed them. And after two minutes, I have the wipe out of my life because I hit the reef. You know, I, I I didn't know that there was a reef, and I was so excited to 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 get down there on time and and not be much slower than the other guys. Nothing broke, uh, but uh, that was a lesson for me. You know that you better always check if there is a reef somewhere. Uh, but oh, okay, come back to technology. Yeah, yeah, like like from from you know from the photo shoot to actually having the pictures in the magazine and the VHS. Yeah. On VHS. Yeah. The, the route yeah. from that. How does yeah. it work? Yeah. yeah, but let's let let let's start uh, a little bit before that because as I said, no email, no fax, no mobile phone. Patrick, no mobile phone. You know, I, I I will always remember back then we were taking pictures with Silver Casinav, with a French photographer, uh, because I didn't know anybody else, and 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 Klaus and, and Werner suggested him, and uh, uh, he was one of the very first guys who had a, a special satellite phone. You know. Uh, and, and, and when I saw him, I think that was only at the second or third year of my photo shoots, I saw him standing on the beach with a phone in his hand. I, I couldn't believe it because that didn't exist. you know. And so the reality for me was that uh, we had a landline obviously in the house and I could make phone calls with that. But there was a phone booth at Baldwin Beach. You, so often when we were in, there was no phone booth in Sprax. There were no houses in Sprax back then. Uh, so I, I always had to drive to Baldwin Beach, get to the phone booth, call the helicopter pilot, for instance. Yeah. So it, it, it was super co uh, complicated. There were no, uh, better hey, forecasts. Baldwin, just, just for, just for the people, that's, that's the yeah. one between Hokipa and Paia, right? Is that? It's between Sprax and Hokipa. Ah, uh, between, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, somewhere. It, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. yeah. But it's a public beach where you cannot windsurf. But it had a phone booth. Yeah? It was strictly forbidden to windsurf there. So I had to drive there, make a phone call, and and, and, and go back to, to Sprags or, or wherever because Sprags was a sandy beach. There was nothing there, absolutely nothing. Yeah? Uh, and, and concerning weather forecasts, you know, today you get on your phone and you check the weather forecast. Back then, we watched TV in the morning to get an idea of what, what the matter, weather might uh, be like. And the weather forecast on Maui, it's a little bit of rain and windy, you know, and uh, yeah. mixed uh, or, or some clouds, you know, so the, the forecast was most of the time useless because it wasn't made for wind surface. Huh? Yeah, for the, uh, for the people that were not in Maui, it can be sunny one minute and then you can get a rain shower the next and then yeah. then you can get sunny again so yeah for photo shooting it's uh it can be stressful let's let's say the least absolutely yeah and, and on maui you have you have the north shore and the south shore and it happens quite often that it's cloudy on the north shore but it might be windy and sunny on the south shore yeah? today you get on your phone again you check the webcam in the south back then that didn't exist I would drive to a phone booth again, and um, after knowing, getting to know quite a few people, we had restaurants on the south, in the south, on the beach. So we would call a waiter in a restaurant who was a windsurfer, and he would tell us if it was sunny and windy. You know, there was no other other way to find out. There was one thing, you know, that back then they still had the the, the sugar uh, factories. And when the, the smoke was pointing to the south, you kind of knew that it would be windy in, in, in the south. So uh, it, it, it just, just to get everything organized was so much more difficult. But it, um, we didn't know anything else back then. You know? so, uh, uh, but people had to be more disciplined. And what we did is we met with all the team riders at 7.30, at our house every day. And then we would wait there and decide what the decisions would be, you know, and, and, and they make a decision and some people could leave and uh, they had to come back to us somehow during the day and with the other people we, we, we would work. Yeah? Uh, 
and, and, and then the next thing was, as you mentioned, no digital cameras. You know, we we were still taking slides, and uh, uh, pretty soon I switched to photographer. I started working with um, uh, Torsten Indra, uh, who I really like to work with. Uh, we have been working for something like twenty five years, yeah, uh, because it. It wasn't that easy to work with me because, you know, I was going 12 hours a day full speed. Uh, but in, in, in the first few years, it was, uh, you know, uh, 36 pictures per roll. That was the first limitation, you know, obviously. And it was especially bad if there was a really good day in Hokipa and the guys already had housings. So you would need to take your housing apart, clean your camera, put the film in, put the camera in, close the housing, screw it all up, swim out in Hokipa. 36 pictures later, you swim back in. So more than a half hours are gone for 36 pictures. Uh, and then uh, there was a laboratory in Maui that was specialized for sports photography. And they did overnight developments of the slides. So usually at the end of the day, we would drive to Kahalui, the, the little town in, in uh, on Maui, bring the, the, the rolls to that uh, lab. And if you paid an extra fee, they would do it overnight and you could collect them the next day. Uh, and then uh, Thorsten and myself, we both bought a light table. You know, we had a big light table and lenses. And we were looking... Usually we had roughly about 10,000 slides. Yeah. We were looking at 10,000 slides every evening. After we stopped shooting, we were looking at slides often until 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. Usually when I came home from the photo shoot, I could hardly walk because my back, you know, when you look at slides, <laughs> you're yeah. always like this. And, and the light table is hot. You know, it was pretty hot, so it was, uh, but it was fun. And then you have to organize the, the slides somehow, you know. Uh, you can't just, uh, you know, so I, I organized binders and we separated them into into boards and stuff. You couldn't, like today, you know, you have a file on your computer, you throw the pictures wherever you want them, or you name them and then you find them. Back then, it was a physical filing for every yeah. single slide had to be moved around, you know, so it was, uh, and then at the end of the shoot, I would fly home with a carry-on and I was obviously not willing to check it in because imagine if they lose it, you know, so I would carry 10,000 slides with me on, 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 on board of an, of an aer airplane. And, um, and then if you, you wanna, say, if you want to have those shots in the magazine, you have to copy the slide or do you send a print or what, what do you do? You copy the slide. Um, the, the, the problem was that the copies were never as good as the originals. Yeah. So, uh, but to a certain degree, I kind of preferred this time because back then, you know, we had really good shots and then you would select the very best shots and then you would say, this magazine gets this shot, this magazine gets this shot. And they all had exclusive rights to their shots. You know, they couldn't... Uh, now, when you have a good shot it's and you everywhere. put it on the internet, it pops up everywhere. And it also for the photographers, you know, back then they had their picture and it was, was worth something. You know, they could sell this one slide and you could do something with it. It was a little bit uh, difficult. And then you had to mail the slides, you know, something no, nobody can imagine anymore <laughs> today <laughs> because you click and the picture is there. You know? And we, we were sending slides all, all over the world. And the same was true for all of Jason's travel stories. You know, we would always hire a photographer. He would go there and then he would come back. He would select the slides, send them to us, and we would resend them and and uh, uh, give them to certain magazines. So we had deals with magazines and we always had to be very careful because, you know, you didn't want to piss anybody off because back then uh, there were two or three magazines in almost every bigger country. country. Yeah. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. Incredible. That's, that's but at the same time, you know, there were also good things back then because I remember, uh, I think there was a phone booth in uh, in Hokipa, and when when we saw the conditions were really great, uh, we would uh, and, and and we said it would be great to have a helicopter. 
Uh, I called uh, Don Shearer from Windward Aviation, who is a, uh, also someone I worked uh, with for, for years and years. And uh, he would, uh, nowadays, for the last few years, we had to drive to Kahului, go to the airport, fly with him to Hokipa. So you, we, we wasted another 15 minutes of the photographers and, and video guys' time. But back then, it were the cowboy days, you know. The helicopter would fly in, would land on the hill. Not in Hokipa, but on the other side. Uh, but the, the cows were there. It was cowboy country. The helicopter would land there. We would run over, jump in the helicopter, and we would take pictures. Sick. And nobody would care, you know. Yeah. In the last 10 years or so, people would... The, the helicopter pilot couldn't do that anymore because he got into too much uh, problems that, that people were For calling sure. in and... and, and and wanting to sue him, and 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 uh, so yeah, it was uh, very very different times. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But what didn't change is having team riders and selecting riders, and as we mentioned, starting with the F two days, which I basically had to do from my from my mind and from my you know couldn't Google it when I googled arrows F two the Formula One Arrows team pops up. <laughs> you do, like, you know, so I just had to ask around and uh, I don't know, let's start with the, with the ladies and, and I'm going to ask you something maybe not a little uncomfortable later, but um, Karen Yagi is a person, she was actually my boss at Patrick. <laughs> and, you know, now nowadays you know her as this down-to-earth, really hardworking, like really you know, focused and uh, super, you know, like precise and organized. How was, uh, how was Karen when you met her and uh, when she was on the F2, F2 Arrows team first? I, I mean, I haven't talked to Karen in ages, but I don't think she changed much. She was very professional, very organized, never any problems you know she was yeah. she was great she was very easy uh, to work with actually all the girls i ever worked with were, were pretty easy to work with maybe with the exception of brit Dunkerbeck. she was uh, a little bit more difficult <laughs> yeah but you say all the women you've worked with i yeah. went through archives on the jp website with uh with the catalogs and whatever and there's not that many there's not that many. And nowadays, um, you know, there's quite a big push for the woman's side, uh, equal prize money, mm, some girls demanding same money for being world champion as the guys um, from their brands, etc. What was your what was your strategy and what was your outlook uh, towards towards having girls on the team? Uh, you sure you really want to get into that topic? Yes, yes. <laughs> as much as uh, you, whatever you're going to say, I'll take it. <laughs> so let's go. Yeah, yeah. it's, um, you know, at the F2 times, uh, we actually had quite a girl team, you know. We had, uh, I prepared a list. We had Nathalie Lelevre. I don't know if you remember her. She was I really famous. We had Karen Yagi. We had Jutta Müller multiple times world champion from Germany. Uh, and we had, uh, we had Tony Fry. She wasn't that famous. And we had Britt Dunkerbeck. Yeah. So back then we actually spent quite a good portion of, of, of our budget on, on, on women, but we also had bigger budgets. Yeah. It's, it, it, it uh, you know, I don't want to uh, use any numbers, but the amount of boards that we sold back then, you know, we were not comparable to anything we ever achieved with, with uh, JP afterwards. Yeah? So we, we had some budget uh, available. And if you look at the magazine ads that we did back then, uh, we, we, we just uh, had some budget. You know, as F2, we even had, give you an example, we had an F2 magazine. I don't know if you, if you have ever seen that. You know, uh-huh. we, we printed our own magazine. You know, we had uh, about 40,000 mailing addresses mostly in the German-speaking countries. But if I remember correctly, I think we even did a, at the beginning an English and a French version of it. And we had a journalist produce this magazine 
uh, was also lots of writer stories and new products and stuff. We mailed it to 40,000 people all over Europe. Uh, and if, if nobody would ever be able to afford that today, you know, impossible. But uh, I think that the quality of the contact that you had, you know, we, we really, we, we got a lot of letters from people who read the magazine and stuff, you know, and, and for instance, we once in that magazine, we announced this dragon tattoo contest. You know, we've, we had the year of the dragon with yeah. FF2 and we announced that in the magazines and we had tons of people having the dragon tattooed on their arm and sending us pictures and we gave away one board for free. So there was really some interaction. You can't compare it with today's interaction on the internet, but it was just a um, uh, time where we had a bigger budget. So we could also afford uh, uh, girls. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and let's face yeah. it, a lot of the girls' campaigns were really... Mm, really sexy, really, you know, bikini orientated. And, you know, there was, there was a little bit of that. It was a different time, obviously. Right. I mean, maybe not necessarily from F2, but you remember magazine covers with, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, so yeah. yeah, back to the girls. Yeah. Yeah. With, with F2, we, we didn't uh, go in that direction. We, we, we showed them as, as athletes, like, like, like the guys, you know, but then, uh, you know, we also had, good years and not so good years and, and I remember one one year I had to cancel Jutta Müller's contract which was really a very very uncomfortable thing for, for me because she was a super nice person still is you know I haven't met her in ages but she, she still lives on, on Maui I think is busy with horses there and stuff but she was really famous in Germany and it, 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 it was uh, great to have her and uh, Actually, by the way, when I think about her, I, I need to uh, give you a quick story of a photo shoot with her. Uh, you know, she was really a tough girl, you know, racing full on, even when it, you know, it photo shoots, you know, it, you sometimes your sail is one size, at least one size too big, but that's or all three. you have. You or have three sizes. Now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Yeah. right? And, and, and she would never complain, you know, she would, she, she would go, we, we do pictures. And we, so we do pictures with her with the helicopter, you know, and I, many people were laughing about it, but I was always in the helicopter kind of directing the shoot. I had my list of things that I wanted to do. I was in radio contact with someone on the beach when we were done with one person, I gave that person a signal to leave and I would call the beach to send the next person in because I've seen other photo shoots where five people are on the water at the same time and the helicopter doesn't know where to go and you waste a lot of money. So we were shooting Utah Miller. I don't remember on what kind of equipment and she's going back and forth and the helicopter follows her. We do pictures, we do video and and here she goes, and then we see a huge hammer shark going underneath of her. Uh, and the helicopter pilot couldn't resist and just turns around and follows the shark. Yeah? And somehow, uh, Yuta realized what happened. You know, I, I still don't know why she realized, but she realized that we were following the shark. And when we came back to her, she completely freaked, you know, because she was afraid that the shark would, <laughs> would still be around somewhere. But but it, but it wasn't, but, uh, you know, I, I absolutely felt with her because I would shit myself as well when I see, and it was a, a big one, you know, a, a really big one, but coming back to, to girls. Yeah. Um, it's, um, what is it? Really, how is it? How do you, how do you try to get their value? How do you market them? How, you know, because uh, yeah, we have a different time and just speak freely. Come on. I mean, nobody's going to get offended and obviously, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, obviously you did your decision based, based on what you thought the marketing impact was or, or whatever. So, yeah. you know, at, at F2, as I said, we always try to be very structured. Yeah, and, 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 and organized. So we, I had a girl in the office, Mickey Supple. She was the sale, uh, administrator and, and marketing assistant. And she would, for instance, 
uh, follow all the coverage of, of every single rider that we had on the team. You know, we, we, we received all the magazines, all the international windsurfing magazines, and she basically did a clipping service. Yeah? So we had an Excel sheet, and I knew exactly how many pictures everybody had by the end of the year. You know? And Jason was always the king. It was always su surprising with his travel stories, you know. Uh, but uh, the girls were just not 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 close to to any of the guys, you know. And and it's uh, if you have a limited budget, it's it's a really difficult decision. But uh, uh, and for me, I, I also think that you know, obviously, as a brand, you want to sell to girls also. Huh? But is it easier to sell to girls having a female team rider? Or do girls also look at male riders? And if they think they are cool, they might buy this brand. Uh, and if you, if you have a certain, I mean, we always had girls, but for sure it's true that we spend way more for, for, for guys than, than, than for girls. And it's just the, the way the sport went, you know, in the days of Jutta Müller and, and uh, Britt Dunkelbeck, The, 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 the women's fleet was almost the same or was the same as the men's fleet. Huh? And later on, the women's fleet became smaller and smaller. Huh? Okay, now you can say that's the fault of the industry because they didn't, uh, they didn't sponsor enough girls so that the fleet would be bigger. But uh, as I said already in the first interview, the, the, the industry, the windsurfing industry as such, boards uh, and, and, and rigs, cannot really supply the riders with enough money to, to make a living from that. Yeah? And, and um, even uh, whatever, 15 years ago, the top male windsurfers had outside sponsors yeah? and, and the women didn't have as much or the, just the, the, the women's fleets became smaller and smaller, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And, uh, you know, sometimes I really ask myself, I know the girls were desperately trying, you know, to, 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 to keep it alive, but is it actually doing the sport any good if you have 10 girls competing in freestyle in Fuerte? Uh, or does it show the world that uh, the, the, the competition side of windsurfing in the female area is not that alive? You know, yeah. uh, you know I'm, I'm a passionate bike rider, you know, street bikes. I mean, I have, I have not, I don't have a racing bike or anything. And I love watching MotoGP, you know, in that sport, women don't exist. I know some, some women will now kill me again, but when I go and ride my bike, I see a lot of women, you know, there's probably not 50%, but there's a lot of women, even though it doesn't, there is no professional, uh, MotoGP for women. I don't know yeah. of any uh, any uh, competition for girls on, on motorbikes. You know. Yeah. At the same time, and, if you are like Sarah Kita of Ringa or Delphine Cousin or whatever amazing girl that is really, really on a high level, you know, it sucks. It it's I, like, absolutely, absolutely. You know, don't 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 get me wrong. Uh, heads off to all the girls. You know, the Moreno sisters, Sarah Kita. They are unbelievable sailors. There is uh, whatever five to ten girls who sail on an incredible level, and yes, they would have the right to make the same amount of money, yeah, in an ideal world. But unfortunately, this is not an ideal world. You know, there is just not enough uh, sponsorship money around from industry sponsorship and from outside sponsorship, and um, you know, I don't really have a solution for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, absolutely no question. I'm in favor of equal pay, you know, in, in, in normal jobs. You know, if women do the same thing as men, they need to make the same amount of money. End of story. No, no, no question. But, uh, you know, it's at the end, it's a question. And you learn that in business school in the first few hours of supply and demand, you know, if that regulates the price of a product. And at the yeah. end, As I said already last time, a sport is a product that we try to sell, a show that we try to sell. And if there is a really small demand for a certain sport, the price that you will get 
to put yeah. the show on will be really small. Yeah, and, yeah. and you can you cannot force it. How, how, yeah. how do you want to force it? Yeah. And now so I basic, the, the yeah, group. basically we need to create demand for it, create exactly. market it in a way yeah. that is probably different from men. You know what I mean? Market it. Right. But um, yeah, I think it needs a, yeah, you know, a good marketing been, brain to 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 figure this out, you know, because the solution yeah. is not so obvious. Yeah, yeah, you know, I have been on the PWA management board for many many years, and we discussed this over and over again. You know? uh, in an ideal world, I think the girls would have a girls' tour, huh? because you know, if you see the girls. Competing in Fuerte after the man is always really difficult. If you see the girls by themselves, they're still impressive. Yeah? Yeah. But obviously that's really difficult. Uh, and, and many people have this misunderstanding that the PWA decides uh, which events to put on. It's decided by the event organizers and their sponsors. You know, they put the money on the table, on the table. The PWA doesn't have the money. Yeah. And I hear now, uh, the girls decided that they want the same price money as the men. How, how is this going to work? You know, it's, uh, now if you, as an organizer, if you want to put on an event, you have to pay this, you have to provide the same amount of price money for men and women. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's going to be a little bit less for the men to, to not make organizers pay that whole difference. So, you know, there's a little bit more, I think, from the organizer or even the same from the organizer, but the man got a little bit cut, which uh, is hard to take, but it is, it is what it is. Okay. So it's, so it's a, PWA has kind of an internal system to, to balance it out. In the... Yes. Yes. Okay. And now uh, also no, no new event can make a man only event like some of the existing events they still have men only because that's been there for years and girls are trying to of course get in there like maybe we will see uh slalom women in forte this year maybe okay uh right. but like a new event if you're a new event you cannot take men only so okay. yeah well, interesting that, that, uh, yeah that's a yeah. really hot topic you know because if you think it through the result of this could be worst case that a potential organizer says, I simply can't afford it. So you can yeah. either have a man's only event or nothing at all. Uh, on on, on the that. other side, on the other side, there is a lot of companies with, with policies that, um, that are very, uh, you know, for equal, yeah, for equal rights and equal, you know, equal gender rights, equal pay and whatever. And then, they are maybe more inclined to sponsor a sport where, where it's, uh, well, that's, I'm a, I'm an optimist. So I always, uh, <laughs> I always try to, you know, try to market the best possible scenario. So yeah. let's see, uh -huh. let's see how it goes. And, and it's interesting, the impact on the, on the fleet as well, on the fleet size, on the fleet level and whatever, you know, because now it's, there is much more reward for the girls to, to compete. But um, yeah, yeah. back to Karen Yagi, I'm going to have her on the podcast. And there is really not one dirty story you can tell me about, uh, about Karen. <laughs> <laughs> really, not even one. <laughs> no, honestly, I mean, it's, you know, it's 30 years ago, uh, probably 25 to 30 years ago. But she was a, a great girl, a great writer, a great athlete. I... No, I have lots of stories, but not about Karen. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the world champions, more on the world champions. Francisco Goya, you had him on arrows, and he's not, at the not, 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 not under my time. Ah, not uh, under your time. No, because no. it's it's, um, it's interesting when you're you know a, a brand sale brand owned by F2. The guy is writing for Fanatic. Actually, he's writing for his own board brand, but it's marketed under Fanatic. Uh, winning world titles and taking these world titles away from an F2 rider. So I was wondering like, uh, if, if that was your call, but it uh, looks like it wasn't. So no. no, that was when I already left. And I think it only lasted for a year or something like that. Yeah. But Francisco, uh, he was 
But I will, uh, I, I, I said it so many times, but I have many memories which I will never forget. Uh, I, I was, I think I was on vacation on, on, on Maui, staying at Andy's, uh, or what was it called, uh, Andy's Beach, uh, next to Sugar Cove. And, and, uh, uh, that was still at F2 time. And, and Francisco would come with his, uh, portfolio, you know, applying for a sponsorship for, for F2. I think that was before he went on to Finet. Uh, but, uh, we just couldn't afford him. We, we already had enough riders, but he was a super nice guy. You know, I, I always really liked him and, and unbelievable sailor. Uh, so I would have loved to him, have him on the team, but I couldn't afford it. And this, this Eros thing, yeah, you know, I, I, I told you the other time, uh, the, the end of F2 was really chaotic, you know, when, when, when Jacobs took over and, and they did things which we didn't understand. They also started the Maui project. I don't know if you remember that that was kind of to replace uh, JP. Martin, again, we are already in an hour and a half, uh, an hour and a half in the interview. So it looks like we're going to have Martin Brander 3.0, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not sure if people can stand it. I think I think they're gonna they're gonna eat it up. We gonna we gonna spread it out in time, make a teaser, you know, whatever. <laughs> all good, all okay, good. Up to you. Uh, but let's um, let's finish it off because I hear I heard that there was a story that finally made you go over the edge of leaving. F2 and, and going for that JP project, uh, you know, separately. So, so what was that? What was that about? Yeah. Um, you, you cannot imagine this whole scenario, you know, when, uh, when the Jacobs group, uh, which back then it was actually called Mistral sports group because he bought Mistral first and then fanatic and then F2, uh, when they took over. And, um, as I told you last time, I kind of, left but then I couldn't leave so I came back and, and, and it was total chaos in the company you know uh, Jacobs had some managers who were supposed to run the sporting goods group and uh, but uh, you know there were brand managers for uh, Fnatic uh, for Mistral and I was there for F2 and we actually also had uh, Eros and we discussed <clears throat> we had North Shore it's another story we, we could talk about because it was quite quite a wild story. Uh, and um, yeah, so we had those three brands and, and, and it wasn't clear how the company should be structured. You know, who is reporting to whom? You know, I, I had no idea who is going to be my boss. There was rumor that uh, the former Mistral brand manager would become my boss, which I you know thought, are you serious? You know, we are much bigger, we are more successful. So it was total chaos and nobody knew what's, what's going to ha happen next. And then we all received an announcement that there will be a meeting in a special meeting hotel. And it turned out to be a castle, which was owned by, by Mr. Jacobs. It was a seminar hotel, but in a really old, beautiful castle, mega expensive. And Mr. Jacobs owns this hotel. And every company that he owned was forced to book a certain amount of days in this hotel so that the hotel could survive. Right? So, but they said, okay, we're going to have a three day meeting in this hotel. And during this meeting, we will discuss everything and we will put a structure in place so that you finally know who is your boss. Do you still have a job? Because it was also up. You know, I wasn't too worried, but uh, nobody knew what's, what's, what's going to happen next. So we uh, arrive in this uh, hotel and everybody had his own studio, luxury, pure, you know. And then the next day in the big meeting room, uh, we had the first meeting. And um, so we were all hoping, okay, by Sunday, we will know. Do we still have a job? What will be my position? To whom do I report? Where do we produce? Because we had our own factory in, in, in Austria and uh, the factory in Thailand was already also an issue. Most of the other brands produced already a large percentage of their boards in Thailand. And then we have this first uh, meeting in the morning 
And I'm not 100% sure, but I think Mr. Jacobs himself came in, you know, all his managers, and there were plenty of managers on top of us, you know. Yeah, I think he personally came in and said, uh, okay, there's an agenda, but I decided last minute to cancel this agenda because I'm thinking of investing more money in the sporting goods business. So I want all of you to split up in small working groups and make a proposal who we should buy. Not in windsurfing, outside of windsurfing. Think big, you know, don't limit yourself, think big. Every group should come up with a with a brand that we could buy and prepare a small business plan. And we all looked at each other. I don't know if I'm going to have a job tomorrow, what my position is going to be, but we should. Okay. He said, everybody out of here, go into small different rooms and have a meeting and do a brainstorming who we could buy next. So I was in a group with, with the purchasing manager from F2 and I don't remember who else was in there. So all the middle management of all the brands were there, not just the brand managers. Also, the purchasing people and salespeople of every single brand, and especially the sales salespeople, didn't know if they would have a job, you know. So we went into our separate room, and then we thought this 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 can't be true, you know. And then decided, okay, what the heck? Let's let's buy Salomon. We have no idea about it, but okay, we're gonna propose in this meeting we buy Salomon. So we had to, and, but we had no, you know, there was no internet back then, so we couldn't yeah. Google what, what the turnover of Salomon, uh, how many people, anything. So we we put something on paper which was total crap, and then I think after half a day we had to go into the big meeting room. And that was really a proper meeting room already back then. You could connect your uh, notebook with the floor and it would come up on screen. And, and then we had to do a presentation about complete nonsense. You know? And for me at that moment, it clicked. Uh, what out the here. heck is this? Yeah, I'm exactly. <laughs> what, what is this? You know, and, and then actually one of my, uh, of the guys working for me got married the next day. And then I asked if I could leave because this guy is going to get married and they gave me approval and I left. And that at that it. meeting, there was nothing decided. And that was for me just um, clear that uh, I, I can't stay in this company where uh, maybe I'm too stupid or, or maybe I don't think big enough, but I, I, I want to run my brand and do my job. You know? and, and, and it was the best decision I ever made in my life, you know, because... Yeah. It, Afterwards, it was even more chaotic and people were coming and going, as I said the other time. The money that was wasted there, if that would have been invested in the sport, in girls, for instance, you know, that the sport could be at a totally different uh, stage or situation. Yeah. Yeah. Whole waste of money, waste of time. And you don't strike me as a guy that likes... uh, likes those two. So, <laughs> but, uh, speaking of, uh, wasting time, uh, we're not going to hold you any longer. So we need to make a third episode about just about writers, just about writer stories and the parties and all that kind of thing that people actually really want to hear the inside. <laughs> and you've, I and better you've be careful with... what I say then. So not, not to piss anybody off. <laughs> nah, nah, it's okay. I think, you know, so many of these people have moved on and so many, you know, like, I don't think it's, uh, if you were wild when you were 21 and doesn't really, you know, it's not something surprising. No. So, so I think it's, uh, I think it's all right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, taking us through your life story pretty much. And, uh, yeah, we'll have you on uh, again. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. And yeah, maybe to, to, to round it up, I just want to say that I always felt super, super lucky. You know, as you said it, I, I had, I was basically lucky. I was at the right place at the right time, met the right people. And, uh, I couldn't be more thankful, you know, because I had yeah. 28 fantastic years with a lot of work, but, uh, I always uh, enjoyed it so much and I would never want to miss it. Uh, and, and I met so many fantastic people. And, and if you really want to do a third one, we, we should talk about that because there were so many people along the way who, who, who I met and, 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 and there was, uh, 
uh, lucky enough to to be able to work with uh, and, and, and we could talk about that yeah bit. since since I'm only gonna ask you about writers the next time let's let's just one more question because we always end with talking about the future and okay. last time I totally out of the blue I asked you so what if North sales the new North sales comes on and ask you and you didn't actually deny or you didn't actually say this idea was total fantasy or whatever. So uh, is something in the works there? <laughs> you sure it was totally out of the blue that you asked me that? I, I did. I really did. Of course, yeah. you know, there's a new brand, yeah. big brand with uh, big traditions forming and you are, uh, you are free. So maybe it's, I don't know, subconsciously it made sense, but uh, I thought you were retired to be honest. So... So yeah, yeah. It, it, I told you last time. I still consider myself uh, retired, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this rumor has been around and and, and uh, has been talks and uh, nothing decided yet. But uh, tell you the truth, uh, I don't see it happening. Yeah. So I'm. Uh, um, I've been actually thinking a lot. What uh, if I want to do something and what I could do? You know. Uh, I, for instance, bought a drone and fly a lot with a drone now. And no, 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 not so much about windsurfing, but also, but, uh, you know, it, when I left JP, I always had this vision that um, it would actually be cool to give something back to windsurfing. Yeah? And uh, I still haven't uh, found the final answer for that, but, but two ideas would be, you know, number one, maybe to get involved with the PWA and, and, and try to look for sponsorship. But I think at the moment it's probably more difficult than ever, but let's see, maybe, maybe in a year or so. Uh, and, and, and the other thing is that uh, it was actually interesting, your reaction uh, at the beginning when we talked about my entering the windsurfing world, you know, because I totally agree with you that it's still the same problem. Uh, I think one of the major issues of windsurfing is the dropout rates that we have. You know, there's so many. Uh, I don't have the latest figures, but then when I was still at, at JP, uh, they always saw the, the VDWS, the, the, the uh, Association of the German Windsurfing Schools, which are the, worldwide. Most yeah. of the windsurfing schools around the planet are under their umbrella. They always claim that they. Uh, have 40 to 50,000 beginners every year. Uh, and, and you wonder where, where do they all go? You know, they all get lost. And I think it's mainly because they never get over this thing to learn how to chat, you know, and to really properly get planning. And, and because then that's where the fun starts. You know, it, it's actually funny if you think about it because in, in, in German, uh, Uh, windsurfing is surfing or always was you know even the magazine is called surf uh, because back then when they started surfing didn't really exist at least not in Europe and uh, so and, and for me if you ask me you know if you go full speed into a chive and you have the same speed as the wind and you throw your rig around that's almost like surfing right it's almost like skateboarding snowboarding or surfing because you have no no power in your rig anymore and you basically surf. And and that's what what gives me the, the kick out of windsurfing because I hardly ever go to Maui or, or, or really wavy places. And but that's also what many people miss. You know, they, they never get to that stage. They fight with uh, learning how to chip like I did um, 30 years ago. So To make it short, I have this, it might sound crazy, but I have this thing still in the back of my mind that I've been asked by a few people. So I'm considering to maybe one day put on some chiving clinics, you know. Uh, but if I would do it, I would do it a little bit different. I would organize proper uh, uh, device on the beach uh, to really practice on the beach Because if, if you look at windsurfing centers, they still have their worn out old windsurfing boards lying there with a mast and the boom and the rope. And, and that's how they teach how to chat. You know, and I think we are a little bit further now with, with technology and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And there's drones and there's two way radios. And, 
so I, I, I wouldn't be able to to to, to social windsurfing by that, but maybe it gets something going. And I, I just think, you know, the windsurfing centers are more and more at the stage where they simply rent out equipment. Yeah, they do beginner lessons and they rent out equipment. But I think we, the whole sport, would need to put more energy into getting people to a level where windsurfing, windsurfing really starts to become fun. Yeah, somewhere yeah, in between. Yeah. Because when you're there, you're hooked. Yeah? And in my case, you're hooked for life. You know? And to, to mention Robin Nash, that's the stoke factor. You know? But if you fall on every second jibe, uh, do you ever reach this stoke factor? You know, that you, you're almost addicted, that you need to, to keep doing it. You know? And if I would do something like this, I would also put a little bit of a fitness program in because it's also something that I miss a little bit. You know? in, in Austria, I keep going back to skiing. Uh, when I was a teenager, there was every fall on TV, there were TV shows about how to get ready for the skiing season. You know, people would do gymnastics together to get ready for the skiing season. I have hardly ever seen a professional windsurfer doing a warm-up before he goes out. Uh, and, and so in a seminar like that, you could also show people a little bit the most important things that you do to be fit enough uh, for windsurfing, get your core area fit and stuff. And, and, and so uh, I think that that could be something cool, but uh, I haven't made up my mind. So let's see what the future will bring. Both of those, both of those sound like, sound great. I'd much rather have you doing those than, uh, <laughs> than manage another brand, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to be back for... Uh, for Martin 3.0 writer, writer talk. If, if we do not get enough, or if we don't get many people protesting against it, let's see. No, 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 no. Don't worry about it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. And there we go, my brother, 2.0. Like, if there is someone that we have had already and you think, I want more from them, I want more from them, let us know in the comments below. Uh, I have heard Matt Check just said Antoine Albo doing the podcast. Yes, I heard Lena Erdl is on the, on the list. She's getting done. We've also had another couple, which I can't tell you about. So stay tuned to the channel. Subscribe so you don't miss another episode every Wednesday released on YouTube and also on Spotify and iTunes. Oh yeah, uh, see you for the next one.